So today I'll talk about roots. I just want to mention one thing before. I gave a talk like two or three months ago at best. So most of the talk today will be new, but some of it won't. So people who are coming back will have to suffer or enjoy again. Okay, so roots. So what is, so I, I call it towards the second uh, revolution. And the question is, what is the first revolution? So the first green revolution is uh, attributed to Professor uh, Borlaug, and it's considered this huge increase in crop yields, uh, mainly uh, grain yields that we, we have seen uh, due to uh, use of uh, pesticides and new varieties. But these yields got to a plateau. In the last few years, we, we, this yields are in a plateau, and we, we are not going up to the next uh, level. So we think, because we are root people, but also trying to be objectively, that the next revolution in increasing the yield should come from the roots, since the roots, and this is towards the second great revolution, were until, let's say, five years ago, much less studied than the above ground. It's like 5% uh, of publications are, were on the uh, roots. So what do roots do? Roots have many functions. They have anchorage, water and nutrient uptake, storage, biosynthesis, asexual reproduction, and communication with other plants and in, with the rhizosphere. I will now, I'll present to you uh, several studies that were carried out in my lab. These uh, studies are dealing with roots. Uh, and just to show you how I got excited into roots, so I'll start with the first project. So the first project is the role of root orders in water and nutrient uptake. So we have this title, and then the question is, what are root orders? In order to understand that, it will be easy to first understand what are river stream orders. So when you think about rivers, it's easy to think that a small creek goes to a bigger creek, to a bigger creek, and then to the large creek. And as we say in a poem in Hebrew, all rivers at the end go to the sea. So this is the main river that goes to the sea. So the small river is order one, and the uh, order that gets orders one is order two. If you're an order that gets in order two, you're in order three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So this is in rivers. So in plants, it's more or less the same, but it's below ground, okay? And, but, and we're not going to the sea, but we're going to the tree instead of the sea. Now in roots, until, uh, and also today, most uh, research is usually based on diameter. So you have large roots and small roots, fine roots, coarse roots, different people use different, uh, and the size is important for people. And this term of root orders came up in the literature already a few years ago, but not much research was done about it. And we were interested to know what is the function, whether there is a function for this specific root orders and what it is. So for that, you need students or postdocs. And we had a very good postdoc in my life, uh, uh, Boris Revald. Uh, Dr. Boris Avald, who is now a PI at uh, Boku University. And we started to work on trees. And we decided to work on orange trees, just this is what we had. And we grew them hydroponically. So you see they're growing hydroponically in a nutrient solution. And then we decided to look at the root orders. For that, we constructed these chambers, mini chambers, you see here, where they in hold with them, a piece of a root order. Could be root order one, two, three, different root orders. Now this chamber, we connected to a scale. Okay, so the plant here, this is the, the orange tree growing in a nutrient solution with our chamber. The chamber is connected to a scale with a nutrient solution. Now if this area is taking water up, so what will happen to the weight in the scale? It will go down. The scale is connected to a computer, and by this we could know exactly the rate of uptake of, this, of every specific root order. Okay, this is the hard thing to explain. I hope this is understandable. 
So we are measuring the uptake of different root orders just by connecting them to a scale. And what we see is here. We have root orders one, one to three. This is distilled water. This is under nutrient solution. We saw a little bit decrease of uptake when we have nutrient solution versus, versus distilled water. But what was interesting, but also expected, is that root orders one, the smallest root orders, are uptaking much more water, nutrient solution. Okay. So this was expected. And then the really surprising thing, and the thing that we, we were really, we had to repeat and repeat in order to make sure we understand what's happening, is when we went to the four and five root orders, the large roots, we saw water coming into the scale. The weight is going up. We couldn't understand it was happening and we did it and again and again, and that's what we saw. So we have an influx in root order one, two, three, and an efflux water coming out from the high root orders. Now the question was whether this is a active or passive uh, going out of the water. I'll show you soon uh, what we think. But for sure we have water coming out and I'll tell you now already what, what we think is the large root orders are the main shuttle for the tree and they're usually older. So in order to maintain a, a relatively wet environment for them not to die, these root orders have both passive and active uh, exits of water. Some people talk about hydraulic lift in other papers. So this is kind of hydraulic lift, but this is in hydroponics, okay? So you have to remember this is in hydroponics. This was the first to see that. So we see this root orders going out. And we see it, so this was, I did it by area, and when, also when we calculate it by weight, so no matter if we calculate the, the piece of or root is there, is by area weight, we still see this efflux water coming out of the high root orders. So now we said, okay, let's see what happens under salinity. So just when we grow them under salinity, you look here, these different root orders. So the main effect is to the root order one. They are significantly decreased, the small root orders under salinity. Also root order three is decreased significantly, but not very, not very much, okay? So what happens when we decrease this root order ones? The hypothesis, if we decrease them, will decrease the uptake of water. So we do see here, one minute, that this, this was under nutrient solution and when we grow them under salinity, you see rates decreased by at least 50%, we, the, the rates of uptake. But we also saw that the efflux that we showed doesn't exist anymore, okay? There's no water coming out. So this shows us that the part of the efflux from high orders is also active. It's not also only a passive uh, effect. So, and then we say, okay, this is under salinity. Now let's give these plants, release them for the stress for two hours. Release them from salinity. What we see? We see this very large increase of, uh, if, of uh, uptake. So the plants are under salinity, they are stressed, they're not taking water, you know, okay? And then we give them an option with no salinity, they drink it. So this is just a summary. This, this is by, before it was by area, this is by uh, uh, weight, this is by area. So you see, this is under control. We see this very unique efflux <coughs> from high root orders, under salinity, very low uptake. And a release, you have a very up, a large uptake. This is the rate of uptake to J. See, so, so this is our first uh, project that I wanted to tell you. When we, we look at the statistics, we see that in these root orders, so you say root order one or smaller, so maybe it's size, but the most statistical thing is the order itself, okay? Not the distance, not where it is in the branch, not if it's up or down, not if it's the diameter. The most significant 
is the root order itself. Okay, and then we, we are continuing to deal with these root orders and we do it in different ways. So this is just, I'm showing you examples. We work on, on papers, we grow the, the, the plants on paper, so we have the roots here. And by this, we could just punch the paper with time and see uptake of nutrients, okay, next to different root orders. So we just, I'll, I'll show you, this was not published yet, so, but this is work that we're doing. So uh, you see the different root orders. This is just an example for potassium. Then this is time and hours. They have a different uptake behavior of nutrients. So not only they're taking water differently or solution, they're, different, they're specifically taking different nutrients differently. And then that also, we look also physiology. So we look at the root respiration. So also the root one and two, they're more active. They respire significantly more than the higher root orders. So what did we see? So water uptake rates were determined by the root order and not by diameter or distance. And water uptake rates under salinity decreased significantly. However, in plants grown in salinity and subjected locally to a non-salt solution, all orders showed only influx. Okay, so this is the first project I wanted to tell you. Root-root interactions. I told you roots have many uh, roles. One of them is the interaction with the rhizosphere. So we have a root system here. In, in this root system, we have different roots, right? So does this root know that, knows that this root is the same? Like, does this hand know that this belongs to the same uh, individual? And what happens when we know, it was already published, that when you have two roots together, so for some reason, this root knows they're decreasing their, their system, okay? So, we wanted to look at this root root interactions. And for that, we used peas as a model plant. And what is, I'll just show you in order to understand the terminology, is this is the roots of one individual. So these are called self. This is the roots of the other individuals are also called self in between them, the purple color versus the red color. But if this red sees this purple, it's non-self. Okay, so we have self and non-self. <coughs> now, what did we do? We took our peas and we split the roots, okay, when they are young, into two platforms. The first one is self. So each, we have three pots. In each pot, we have one plant with its own roots, okay? In this one, we have three pots. In each pot, we have roots from two different individuals, because we take the individual and we split it into two. Half of the roots here, half here. Half here, half here, half here, half here. So all parts here are non-self, and all parts here are self. This is clear? Oh. So the next thing to do is, this is a cast can of non-self roots, you see, when you take an x-ray. And if you go to Vienna and talk about it, this is what it reminds me, yeah. So, I, I didn't get a, a, yet a inspiration for Ithaca for this, but I'll get it in the next talk. So, these are our plants, okay? So this is self and non-self, okay? And then we measure root length in the non-self is significantly decreased versus the self. Photosynthesis is also significantly decreased. Now, the next thing we wanted to see is what happens to respiration. Respiration is a very important process in plants. However, it's much less studied. There's almost no people in the world who measure intact respiration of plants. Although, as you can see, so it could, a large fraction of the assimilates can be expended by respiration up to 70%. So what does respiration produce? ATP, NADPH or NADH, and carbon skeleton. So in my lab, we developed this uh, not very nice looking, but very effective uh, way to measure root respiration. We measure simultaneously both O2 and CO2, okay? 
uh, this is our, and we have these special uh, chambers with Teflon because the O2 is very difficult to measure. And this is, we, we, we put our plants, we seal them, and we measure going gas in and out, in and out, constantly for a week. Okay? And what do we see? We saw this very weird thing. non felt plants had 30% more respiration. So if I'm next to a neighbor, I'm going, I'm nervous. I'm going like that. So the roots, when they are from the same plant, for some reason, they know that we are self. And when I'm far, I'm going. What does increased respiration give us? ATP, OK? Lots of ATP. And this comes on the expense of carbon going to growth. So the roots are smaller. And this, you can see, this is both to, as a CO2 release and also consumption. And this is by time, this is just a day, a night and day, see, of the non-self and self. Okay, so we have these roots that are respiring more just because they're seeing their neighbors. So what is the conclusion? So root length and area decreased when you have non-self. Root respiration increased when you have non-self. So what happens under stress conditions? And one of the most uh, important stresses that we work in the lab is salinity. So we look at salinity, we grow them, we put uh, 100 millimolar NaCl. You see that the, when you are self, you are much more affected than you, in your non-self. And the same thing also to, happens in the shoot and also in respiration. So respiration under salinity increases, but it's in both self and non-self, but it increases less in the, in the non-self. As if we are ready for the stress, we are already respiring too much, so maybe we're more acclimated to our future stress. So non-self plants were less affected by soil stress than self plants, indicating an impossible acclimation to future stress in non-self plants in a feed-forward acclimation mechanism. Our results provide new information on root restoration. And uh, yeah, you could read the paper. So I'll go to the next. Thing. So in the horticultural meeting, I heard about, a little bit about aeroponics here. So I decided just to show that we also do aeroponics in our lab. And we, when we wanted to do it, we wanted to control temperature because we are very interested in extreme temperatures. So we, the thing we thought about is like the ice cream, you know, refrigerators. So we, we built these ice cream refrigerators and we could control the root temperature there very stable root temperature for four degrees up to the, not, no matter what. So we have these chillers at the end of each. Uh, so, and this is how it looks. So we have four containers, I'll show. And we have a nutrient solution here. This stands on a weight, so we know exactly how much water we are giving all the time. And the, it looks like this. So we have a chamber with four plants and the plants are growing in the air and we spray them every minute. Okay, with, with nutrient solution. Now the plants are growing great. We, we looked at hydroponics, soil, and aeroponics. They're growing the biggest one, the aeroponics. And the roots are more similar to soil than hydroponics in their architecture. So this is very, a very good tool to study the roots, the aeroponics system. So what, is, what are the advantages? Easy access to the root, low salt depositions on the root zone. We have adequate aeration lack of uh, mechanical impedance when we want to take the roots so we're not destroying them. And the root development is similar to the soil. The disadvantages are that if you grow, if you live in the desert very far, so sometimes we do have no electricity. 10 minutes without electricity in the desert, the plants are dead. Because there's no buffer to hold the roots. So the first thing you do when you have a student, you make sure he has a smartphone and he gets these SMSs. And the first day it happened, he got 200 SMSs. And then now it's only one per day or something like that. So you have to run fast to see the plants and make sure they're okay. Because most of them are false SMSs. And we have very, you need this technical know-how 
that we, we, we supply. So I'll just show you an example for a research uh, that we, was done. Uh, so this is a grafted bell peppers taken from a company Syngenta. This is in collaboration with them. And we, we were looking at, we were very interested in roots and different root scions, uh, uh, yeah, root stocks. So here we grafted Canon and Canon, and here we grafted Canon and S103, and we looked at the effect of uh, low temperatures on the root zone, okay? So here we have the plants and we grow them either under 14 degrees or just uh, one week for 14 degrees and then recovery or 27 degrees. And then when we look at the above ground, it's, you almost don't see differences. <coughs> but when you look at the roots, and it's easy to look at the roots, you see significant differences between uh, the 103 is much more tolerant in the root wise than the canon. And you could go deeper to the roots and look at root, the projected area and number of tips. And you see a significant decrease. So this is, you don't see anything above ground in the vegetative state, but you do see lots below ground. And then we did a lot, a lot of research. I'm not showing everything. We look, we look at all the metabolites. So phenotypically, we didn't see anything in the shoots, but uh, when you look at metabolites in the shoots, we see large differences from control, okay? When they are under 14 degrees. Uh, and uh, <coughs> there are less differences in the 103, when the root uh, is 103. So this was just an example of uh, aeroponics. And this is also work in progress. So we did publish not all yet, but some of it. And now, almost last topic. I, I know people here are very interested in uh, wine vines. So we also got interested in it like six or seven, seven years ago already. And uh, we started growing Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz in our desert. So why grow wine vine in the desert? First, we have lots of space. Okay, there's light and temperature extremes are, important, are good for the wine. Water, the lack of water is a big advantage. Why? When wine vines are stressed, they produce sugars. And this way, when we irrigate them, we could control exactly how much water to give. No surprises. We don't have water, no have rain. In our area, we have, where well, here we have like 80 millimeters a year, and it's only between the, December to March, 80 millimeters is eight centimeters. It's two and a half inches. It's not a lot. If you go a little more south, it's less. But this is what we have. And of course the wine. So we are also making our own wine. We have Cabernet and so we have things to do. So, and we're not the first ones to do this. The Nabatian 3000 years ago had these wineries. So this is of that 10 minutes from our campus. And this is shift at 25 minutes from our campus. And all these are wine presses, you see? So they had large wine uh, making. So it means there was lot, many wine vines growing, okay? And this wine was exported. You know, these two cities are 3,000 years old. They are sitting on the, what is called incense route from Yemen to the port of Gaza and then to Cyprus and you found in Cyprus, these clay uh, bottles of wine with the stamp of, of that from 2,500 years ago. So wine was in the area and it's now being reintroduced to the area. So all the wine vines in our area are grafted and they're all grafted on one a rootstock rogery, which is the tolerant rootstock for our area. So the rootstock of all our Cabernet Sauvignon, Chiraz, whatever we have is the same, okay? So we grew this Cabernet Sauvignon and Chiraz, the above ground, the below ground is, is the same, Rogery. And we looked at the water in the soil. So we could see in black is Chiraz. Chiraz is taking much more water than Cabernet Sauvignon. The soil is becoming much drier. See, and every four days we irrigate, so every four days the water comes to the same in both of them, okay? 
every four, uh, during the four days, she runs Cabernet Sauvignon slow. Okay, same rootstock. And then at the end of the season, we even stopped irrigating completely. This soil in Cabernet Sauvignon does not go down to there. So there's something differently in hydraulically between them. We repeat an experiment in a greenhouse and we see that again, the Shiraz is taking much more water than Cabernet Sauvignon. And this is an experiment where we stop irrigating. So you see that Shiraz is taking much more water. And when we look at the water potential, so under non-stress conditions, they are similar. Under stress conditions, they both go down and then Cabernet Sauvignon stabilizes, Shiraz continues to go down. And this, these terms for that, I, I won't go into this, but they behave hydraulically differently. And this hydraulic behavior, the different hydraulic behavior, leads also to a different photochemical behavior. So photosynthesis, electron transport rate, in the Cabernet Sauvignon, which takes less water, is always higher than in Shiraz. As if soon maybe I'll close tomata, I need to be efficient, okay? And this, all the time open, I'm less efficient. Okay, so hydraulic and photochemical behave differently, and we think we understand why. And also the wine itself, when we look at the wine, so this is all the metabolites. So in Shiraz, and this is in, in, in this case is the berry itself, we look also at the skin and the leaf. So Shiraz is much more sensitive to this drought. You see many metabolites are changing all the colors. In Cabernet Sauvignon, it's much more moderate, the changes. So we are interested in roots. So what we did is we have this field and we put this uh, mini rhizotone tubes to two meters deep and looked at roots. We uh, look at roots, we measure every 12 millimeters up to the depth of two meters. And this is, and we do it even more like that. So this is our tubes when after we dug the two meters, we put them in and we put them in two distances, 25 centimeters and 75 centimeters from the trunk. So we have a knowledge of the root system going like this and going like that. So we get the impression of a 3D, what's happening below ground. Okay, we're also measuring two distances and also down to the depth. And this is how it looks and these are the roots. And we could see how the root dynamics, what's happening. And what was quite amazing for us is first of all, is how deep these roots go. Because this is drip irrigation, you have to understand. We didn't think we'll get over half a meter or a meter. We get to two meters easily. And this is in, uh, in uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Shiraz when there are 20, where they're close to the stock. So we see roots in both of them. But when we go further from the trunk, you see no roots in Shiraz, only in Cabernet Sauvignon. So Shiraz is growing like this, Cabernet Sauvignon is growing like this. But this is the same root system. So Rogery, the root system is reacting to its above ground, to their different physiological uh, characteristics. And one is going like this, Shiraz, one is going like this. Same root system, Rogery. And this is how it looks. So we, we count the roots. So this is 25 centimeters. This is the 75 centimeters. So this is the red is Cabernet Sauvignon. The blue is Shiraz. So Shiraz behaved in a near anisoidric way, whereas Cabernet Sauvignon in a near isoidric. And this behavior was correlated to high water transport. I didn't show all the results, but it was also accompanied by photochemical efficiency. And root distribution and dynamics change according to the scion. So we think if we have wine vine irrigation, it should take into account the, uh, the cultivar specific water behavior. Although never, nobody does it until now. Okay, last topic. Okay. Salsola inermis. <coughs> this is an amazing plant. This was the plant I was most interested when I got to this place, the desert. This is a <coughs> summer annual plant. So this plant is a very small plant with very shallow roots, 15 centimeters. It's an annual plant, 
that grows only in the summer. So it germinates around March, April, stays small until June, then starts to grow, gets to its maximum October, November flowers and dies. No rain between March and November, no rain, okay? So it's an amazing plant and I was interested in it because I was looking at it. I thought about you, I won't talk to you about it today. I'll talk to you only about what's happening below ground. So we came to this plant, I came when I dug it out. And after I dug it, I saw this thing at the beginning. At the beginning I crushed it and I got something mushy in my hand. I thought what it is, and we have these mud huts. So it's not a pizza hut, it's a mud hut. And we have many mud huts. One plant could have one mud hut, some of them three, two, many mud huts. What is it? We go inside and instead of crushing it, like I did the first time, I open it slowly and I see a weevil. So there are 60,000 weevils in the world, 60,000. No weevils are known to live with plants without harming them below ground. Okay, when you talk to farmers about weevils, they're all scared. In Israel, the palm tree industry is a very important industry. The date tree, it's called also the quarter tree because each date is sell, sold for a quarter. So, and they're very afraid of weevils. They're killing their trees, the weevils. But our weevils, not only they're not killing them, as I'll show you, they are living together and you'll see the root is not harmed at all. So we see larva, we see pupa, we see weevils, see all these terms that I learned to know now. I'm becoming like an entomologist. And eggs we also see. We'll, I'll show you eggs soon. So we have these weevils. <coughs> see, they're, they're very nice. So this is the main weevil we see. <coughs> the Conorhynchus felderamani. So it's nice and cool pictures to show people, you know. They could fit inside. I'll show you there, half a year, and then they, after I could open it and then they go out. So I had a very good student, Oren Shelef, and he did a lot of observations and working, and we made this. So they're out, the weevils are out like two months from the year. <clears throat> then they go below ground, okay? There's a, a larva here. So a small plant has a small larva, a big plant has a big larva, okay? An adult plant flowering has an adult. And this is in blue is the rainfall, and these are the temperatures, average temperatures. And this is also, so they grow together, the weevil and the plant, small together, big together. And then we decided to analyze roots because that's what we do in the lab, we analyze roots. So for our very big surprise, Roots with weevils had 30% more nitrogen. They had 14% less carbon. So we were showing at the beginning that this is what our conclusion from that was the roots are getting nitrogen from the weevils and giving sugars, carbon, to the weevils. As a result, seed of the weevil, of the plants with weevils were bigger. This is what now, today was just uh, the second paper in this story was accept, was it's online today already. And they, and we showed, <coughs> I'm not the PI because uh, as a, this paper was rejected from Nature and from, then I left it for three years and then I gave it to another collaborator. Made me nervous. So, but the plants are also bigger when you have weevils. So I'm not, we're not sure if the weevils are going to big plants or they're helping them to go bigger. We, know, we don't know what is the egg and what is the hen. You know, in order to know what is the egg or the hen, you send them by mail and see what's coming first. Are, are these measurements uh, on, on the distal or the proximal end of the root? So, 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 no, so this is where the, the, the we, we, we made measurements from different areas from the mud hut. Okay, but this is very close to the mud hut. They are most significant when they're close. And then we said, okay, where's the nitrogen coming to the, to the plant? Okay, the, the, this root has more nitrogen. And we look at the weevils in the guts, we saw DNA of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So we have a three-way symbiosis. We have a bacteria, 
living nicely, having, enjoying its life in the weevil, have the weevil and the plant. Everybody are profiting. But we saw that with the DNA in also the adults, and we, for two years we couldn't see nitrogen fixation. We only saw it in the larva. It took us two years to understand we have to look at the larva. So larva has nitrogen fixation. All have the genes for this uh, Klebsiella uh, nitrogen NIF, NIF genes uh, that, uh, that, uh, that take nitrogen, which is a very limiting factor in the desert. Nitrogen and water, these are the limiting factors. So just a reminder, we saw a small plant, small larva, big plant, big larva. So we wanted to show that sugar is going to the plant, to the, from the plant to the larva, yes? And what we did is we took our plant, when it was small, we knew it a small larva, yes? <coughs> and we did the French Revolution to it. We stopped the factory of sugars, right? What happened? We, we created a factory for midgets. All the small larva pupated and became midgets or died. Okay, when sugar stops to come, they become small. So we have this three-way, and this is an amazing system, and we are continuing to, to look at it. This is Dr. Michal Segoli, who is a new researcher in our institute, and I just more or less gave her the project, and she's doing wonderful things with it, and we did a very large survey, like 16 uh, different places in our desert. Every place we go, we find this uh, lava. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, hut, mud hut, the three-way symbiosis, every way, and only at the Sassola in Hermes. You see, this is all the, the sites we checked and the, the percentage. So some areas, the plants get up to almost 50, over 50% 50 of the plants have larva, some only 5%. When we started, we found, we looked at this area uh, uh, and it, we had only 5%. So this is part of the thing that People didn't like this, said it's not, it's not important. But you see, it's everywhere and it's correlated to nitrogen. So you have, when you have more nitrogen in the soil, you have more, uh, more uh, weevils and also nitrate. And it's, this is correlated positively with nitrate and nitrogen, but correlated uh, negatively with sand uh, and positively with silt. So, Texture and nitrogen are correlated with the swivels. So what happens when the plant dies? So the plant dies. If rain comes, the weevil says, okay, I'll go out. Okay, I have nothing to do it. There's no plant anymore. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm not very fast, yes, but I'm a weevil, yeah. So, so I'm going there slowly. I'm saying hi to everybody, you know. <laughs> Philadelphia one or something, I know they are cheering or something. And so this is the adult, yes? So what happens when you have a larva, a small plant, we have a larva. So we open this larva and look at it. Will it go out like it's adult? So it's a larva, so it's still not very developed. So it's slow in thinking, but then it gets to a decision, yes? It thinks, thinks, thinks to go out or not. No, I will stay inside and I'll build my house and get some sugars and maybe water from the plant, give it some nitrogen, live together with my bacteria. So this is our larva. Now, when you have postdocs working and this new PI, so you have these cameras, everybody has a camera. So this was taken with a cell phone in the field. We, we, we planted our plant and we put larva in order to have some weevils. And we see this weevil, I told you we didn't see eggs. So it's digging, you see? So it's digging a hole in order to get to the roots. And then you'll see when the hole is good enough, soon, soon, you'll see. So it takes it. And then you'll see it's good enough. So I'm turning, okay. I'll turn and I have, a, see here the egg. Look at the egg, the egg is coming, but I have to sit down and relax in order for it to come out, you know, breathe in and out. So I'm relaxing and this will take another minute for this relaxation. And but then you have to relax and one minute. 
So when the, that long? So, the, so we have the weevils could be, yeah, from from over two centimeters, from two and a half to three centimeters, uh, up to uh, small. Okay, they they are not 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 some are small, some are big, depending on the species. Yeah. You know what they eat? When? when? They eat leaves. So this plant. So when we put them only with the, with the plant, this is some of the problems we encountered. Yes, they could kill this plant. But usually they don't eat when they have other. Uh, now in the summer, this is more only, the only annual there. They have some perennials. So they eat perennials. Okay. The larva doesn't harm the root. Okay. So see here, here, it's finished. Okay, the egg is there. I relaxed, I, I pushed. And I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm doing very gently. I'll uh, cover it. And then if we continue, we'll see how at the end the whole is covered and the egg is there. So this is an amazing story, I think. Now, because of all these root things, we, I, we have developed what we call root of the matter, which I'm directing. It's sponsored for $7 million. And we are, this is the base money. We are collaborating with, we have 20 PIs in our root of the matter. We are collaborating with different companies that only add some more funds. Uh, we have, uh, so we have this uh, website. You go root of the matter, you see a dentist and another dentist, and then you'll see us. And then we have three projects within our root of the matter. Grafting, which I'm a part of it, and I'm also managing the grafting. We're looking to graft vegetables of tomatoes and melons in order to improve their abiotic tolerance, okay, and look at root, uh, all kinds of root characteristics, how to monitor below, below ground, and how to add bacteria in order to enhance. <coughs> now, the nice thing is that we have, we have a mutual uh, research areas. So we all work together, okay? And this is one of our, this is just now from a week ago, this is one of our greenhouse net houses where you see the tomatoes, we have also bacteria, we're looking at the root and how to monitor. We're doing everything in our greenhouses and we're really, really excited about this root of the matter. Now, I would like to thank all the people who helped. This is part of my lab. And this is our great place in Zdebokil. Okay, if you come to the desert in Israel, you should come to Zdebokil. This is our oasis. You could swim. You could have snow even. You have a waterfall to see the flood. Yeah, this is our campus. It's a great place to be. Not only scenery, we have flowers, okay? It's desert, but we have flowers. We have endemic irises, tulips. We have everything here. We have all the animals. animals. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, no, this, the, these are endemic, these are not. We have ibexes all the way, so gardens are very well protected because they eat everything. <laughs> we have also vultures and of course our weevils. <laughs> okay? I would like to invite you to the 10th International Society of uh, Root Research Conference, which will be held in Israel. We are organizing it. So it won't be in the desert because we don't have enough place to accommodate. It will be not far from Jerusalem. And deadline for submitting is February 14th. If you are a student, we have a special student ambassador program where we, which will be in our institute, where we sponsor everything for you. So time is limited. Please submit and have fun. Thank you. Question for Shimon. So with the self and not with with the self and non-self groups, uh, I think over peas. Yes, peas. Would would you see the same thing if you used clones? Uh, so so that the, the plants that you you were doing the self and non-self were genetic, genetically identical. Plants. So we think yes, and we also we think also the question could be even if you we do different species. We think that if we look at different species, the effect will be much smaller because the competition for resources is smaller. 
when you go to genetically identical, the competition should go increase, and it will. We we didn't do it, but we believe it will increase. The 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 the, 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 the phenomena will increase. Yeah. Shimon Dina in the back. Yeah. That's exactly the same question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Shimon, can you ask Geneva if you have questions? Geneva, do you have questions? Yeah. I, I've got a question for you. And I like your work, <coughs> excuse me, on the on the root order. So I remember that in, in corn roots there's constrictions between the where the junction between the first order roots and the second order root is that gives a very high hydraulic resistance right there. Are you seeing comparable things in other species? No, so we, we just, in the root orders thing, we looked only at, uh, we don't see it. We don't see, see we looked at these uh, orange trees, and now we're looking at tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So in tomatoes, we don't see this thing that you're talking about in, uh, in corn. Okay. So this could be very interesting to look at. It just could increase the, the effect, I think, what you're saying. Yes. So with your weevil story, which is fascinating, it seems <coughs> contradictory that an insect which is burrowing into and eating the roots is actually having a symbiotic effect. So how, how do you speculate the increase in nitrogen is occurring? Yeah, so I don't think they're eating. First of all, the, the roots, they're not eating. They're just getting exudates from the roots. And the nitrogen is just, you know, the weevils are going to the toilet and the plant is getting nitrogen. Mm -hmm. this is, but this is, a, this is a hypothesis, okay? We, we, we really tried very hard to grow them in these uh, terrariums, but uh, no success. And just what we saw is the weevils are going everywhere. So we are still trying. Just, uh, yeah, you said that the root water was the most important thing. You didn't mention the root hairs, the density of root hairs. So in, in, in hydroponics, in trees, we don't see these uh, root hairs. So we don't see them. It's growing in the hydroponics. So the plant doesn't... First of all, the roots don't have No, they don't develop them. So in hydroponics, this is, yeah, it would be very nice to go to the field and look at it. And we won't be able to look just on the hair. We just, we'll need to look at cultivars with hair and without hair. So yes, this is this is a thing we, we thought of uh, doing as the next, looking at plants with hairs and looking at the role of hairs. Yeah. Yeah. So does Vivo have the nitrogen fixation that you were talking about? Yes, so yes. Do you see that over time if the area that is growing well with those plants, do you see an increase in the soil nitrogen concentration? So I said we saw a correlation. We see a correlation. When we have more weevils, we have more nitrogen. Again, I don't know what is the egg, what is the hen. Maybe the weevils are going to an area with uh, more nitrogen. We don't know. Is we, it in the, in the plant or in the soil? In both. I saw at the end, I saw a correlation with nitrate and nitrogen in the soil. So we looked at 16 different areas, abundance of, uh, of weevils. And when we had more weevils, we had more nitrogen and nitrate. Yeah. For the, uh, the grafting study with peppers, um, were the root stocks, were they clonally propagated or were they very closely related of the same strain? They are, they are closely propagated, but they are from a company. So the truth is, I don't know exactly. Okay. So it's not easy working with companies. I don't know. You know but yeah. Okay. We've run out of time, but thank you so much, Shimon, for a fascinating thank lecture. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.